In this lecture on topics in environmental economics, Dr. Pete Schumann uses the example of coastal and marine resources and their associated ecosystem services to highlight the issues and impacts of management and protection of these resources. He lays out the trade-offs associated with prioritizing different elements of coastal and marine systems, including tensions between market and non-market goods, public and private goods, commercial and recreational uses, and current versus future uses. He notes that economics can help address these tensions by using approaches to model individual and market behaviors, identifying economic incentives that could be built into policy, and characterizing the competing values that might limit management strategies. He ends with several examples of research questions related to the economics of coastal and marine resources management. I wasn't really sure where to go with this talk. There's a million different directions uh, that we can take this. I tend to see uh, everything through the valuation lens, as, as you know. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about valuation, but I, I do want to talk a little bit more about what else, what else economics can do and, and hopefully get you all thinking about what economics can do and how you can help me as well. All right, so what are we talking about? Where are we? We're in beaches and dunes and estuaries and mangroves and marshes and reefs and sea grasses. Oh my. All this, uh, I hope I didn't leave anybody out, and all the critters that live in there, right? Ecosystem services, what are they? We've seen this list before, highlighted in yellow, are the ones that we know about in terms of values, right? That, where there's been a lot of valuation effort. And you see most of it is, is white, right? So we're missing, we're missing a lot of stuff. And, and, and think about what we do know, it's, it's pretty much the low-hanging fruit that, that we've been able to value thus far. And I've talked to a few of you about this already, right? We really need much more work in the regulating and supporting service area. But it, it's, it's harder to do. That's why we haven't done it. Uh, as we talked about in the, in, the last, in the last talk, coastal zones are, are densely inhabited, depending on what study you look at. Uh, somewhere between 23 and 40 percent of the world's population lives within uh, uh, 100 kilometers of the coast. 21 of the world's 33 megacities are within 100 miles of the coast, 100 kilo kilometers of the coast. And almost all those are growing, right? So the pressures are increasing. Stressors, what are the stressors? We know these. Direct habitat alteration, over harvest, runoff, nutrient loading, sedimentation, non-native species. All right, so what are the trade-offs here, right? Economics is about looking at trade-offs, costs and benefits. Lots of different ways we can think about trade-offs associated with these resources. Allocation, right? Is it uh, coastal land allocation? The, Interesting about the coastal zone is that, well, on, on the water side, we've got public lands. Oftentimes on the, on the landward side, we've got private lands, right? And those two, uh, the interface, uh, have, have some issues. Marine space allocation, right? Marine spatial planning is a, uh, an important thing that's, that's, that's coming soon. Take no take zones, protected areas, how much protection. Harvest allocation between competing uses, commercial versus recreational, even subsistence, perhaps. Hazard mitigation, right? Sea level rise, storms. How do we mitigate hazards? There's a lot of things, a lot of tools at our disposal for hazard mitigation. Nature-based tourism is a is is a tough thing to to address, right? We 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 like nature-based tourism because it hopefully involves a lot of conservation. People are attracted to these places that are conserved, but the more people we bring in, the more pressure on the resources, right? So there's this balancing act in nature-based tourism. All right, so trade-offs, and how do we measure these? Those are the, the actual trade-offs, and then what kind of values are we comparing? Market values versus non-market values, public goods versus private goods, commercial sector uses versus recreational, current versus future, right? All kinds of trade-offs that we can think about. All right, so what does economics bring to the table? Um, here's, here's the way I'm thinking about this. We can, we can model the behavior of people. That's one thing that economists do pretty well. Uh, if we talk about natural resource management and environmental management, oftentimes we're talking about managing people, right, rather than resources. Right? We can't really manage the fish, but we can manage the, the people that, that harvest the fish. Uh, we bring measures of indicators of well-being. We can bring policy design and, and obviously some valuation work hopefully fits into a lot of that. So if economists, we know one thing, it's that people respond to incentives, right? So what kind of modeling can we do 
to see how people will behave facing different incentives. And there's lots of tools at our disposal. We've talked about a few of these over the last couple days. Uh, game theory, portfolio theory, uh, discrete choice modeling, bioeconomic modeling. Uh, the portfolio theory stuff is, is really interesting. I, I work in a department of economics and finance. Uh, so our two, two disciplines are together. And as one of the more quantitatively oriented people in the department, I get called on a lot to serve on thesis committees, master's thesis committees, uh, for finance people. And most of those are really yucky. But, <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that's interesting about them is, is the parallels, right? If you think about a portfolio of investments, financial investments, you're, you're, you're trying to find the, the right set of investments uh, to balance risk and return. We can think about a stream of, of ecosystem services as sort of you know, the same thing. And this, I love this idea of taking what we know from finance and, and trying to apply it to ecosystem services. The, the, the applications are pretty limited thus far, but I think this is an area that's, uh, that's got some real potential. Right? Take, take what we know from finance and try to apply it uh, to risk and return from ecosystem services. Discrete choice modeling, I gave you a couple ideas from that uh, yesterday, and I'll talk, talk more about it. You know, random utility modeling or, or choice modeling, or those are both sort of discrete choice ideas. And then bioeconomic modeling, it, that encompasses a lot of different things. Um, and I'll give you an example from my work. Indicators for economic sustainability. We heard about return on investment. Oftentimes, folks are interested in profitability, net present value, discounting, and all that comes with that. I think Sheila's going to talk a little bit about this, so I don't want to go too deep. But one thing economists spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about is uh, looking at sort of standards, traditional command and control approaches uh, to management versus incentive-based policies, and, and when command and control is more appropriate than incentives, and when incentives work better, uh, more efficiently than command and control approaches. And so here's sort of the suite of incentive-based policies that we have at our disposal. And again, I don't want to take too much away from what Sheila's going to talk about, but taxes, entry fees, subsidies, payments for ecosystem services or buyouts, cap and trade, ITQs, deposit refund systems, uh, to name a few. There's probably more that we can add to that list. But we tend to favor these policies that operate within you know, the, the incentive structure that people, that people use in their decision making. Valuation, we talked a lot about valuation uh, yesterday. Understanding the baseline, understanding changes in economic value from business as usual or policy-induced change, paying particular attention to opportunity costs. And this is sort of a repeat from yesterday. Adds transparency to the decision-making process, helps improve our understanding of all this stuff, efficiency distribution. What's going to happen if I know I'm going quickly? All right, so something to consider. See who was paying attention yesterday. Uh, I talked about random utility modeling. Random utility modeling is a, sort of a site choice model, close cousin of travel cost modeling. And what do we do? We collect data of, from where people went, alternative sites that they could have gone to, quality variables at each site. And then we're going to try and model the site choice decision. Right? So we're collecting data after a trip has already taken place, but then we're going to model how they made uh, that site choice. Uh, the, the y variable is, this is a multinomial logit regression application. The y variable is, is discrete zeros and ones, but multiple levels. So here's, if there was a 10, site, uh, 10 sites in the choice set, and here's an example of respondent one chose site number four. That's what your y variable would look like, right? It's just sort of a, a vector. And the X variables is, is a matrix, where each row is a site, and each column is a variable uh, at the site. All right, so we model site choice decisions. So what kind of quality variables are we talking about here? I'm looking for one kind of word. This, this is kind of funny. We collect data after the trip has already been taken place, but then we're going back and saying, OK, how did they make that decision? It's an expectation. We're trying to model. Uh, we need an expectation of quality, right? We're, we're modeling a, a decision, trying to model what people were thinking before they made the trip. It's expected quality that matters. But you're doing it post. Correct. We use data, we use data that were collected after the site trip decisions have been made, but we're trying to model what people were thinking before they made that trip. So we need quality variables that are expectations of quality. What does that mean? 
well, their we, excitement level, their anticipation. Sure, or, or, or something that they could observe, right, or, or know about. This is an interesting problem. When we, when we go to modeling recreation sites, we have to sort of try and put our heads in, in put, our, uh, put ourselves in the heads of potential users, and what can they see? So this, this is, you know, just getting into some of the nitty gritty of random utility modeling. We have to think about what people are expecting to encounter. So let's say it was a fishing trip. I do a lot of stuff with fishing. What kind of quality variable is going to drive site choice for a fishing trip? What kind of species? What kind of fish there are there to catch? Right, what kind of fish are there to catch? Okay, so yeah, so what I'm getting at is we need, I need help, right? I need help from the ecologist. I need help from the biologist. Okay, what, what's there? What's, what's available? Where could I get that information? Where could I get information on what's available to catch? Species diversity, right? Potential species that I could catch. Where could I find that data? Survey data. Say again? Biological survey data? Yeah, so some, yeah, some biological survey data, right? Exactly, good. Okay, Department so historical data. I was going to say Department of Fish and Wildlife and yeah. what uh, available licenses there are and yeah. time of season. And then I have to figure out, okay, not just what species they could catch, what's an appropriate quality measure in addition to what species you could catch, but how many fish you might catch, right? It's expected number of fish. How can we do that? How can Fisher we figure that? What's that? Fishing forums online. Okay, yeah. So look at uh, fishing reports. That's one way that we do this, right? We look at fishing reports and try and say, okay, should people go online and check fishing reports? That's one way that people might form an expectation about, about quality. Any other thoughts? Catch size regulation. Okay, Regu restrictions. Absolutely, it's got to be a right-hand side variable, right? If there is a bag limit, uh, size limit, slot limit, whatever it is, yeah. That's got to be in there on the right-hand side. How many other people are going to be there competing for you for that? Right. Yeah, okay. Fish? Great. Pressure. Congestion. Yeah. 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 I think in reality, you probably just like ask your crazy fishing buddy who's been to like all 10 of these lakes in the past two weeks, which one's the best? Expert opinion. Okay. I like that. Uh, so the approach is different, right? All this stuff is, is interesting and, and potentially useful. What's the best? way to measure an expectation of quality so that you can try to model where people are going to go. So how do I do this? I get, there's lots of ways. So if I'm thinking about an expected catch rate, I can use last year's average catch rate. Um, what I typically try to do is, is form a model for catch based on actual catch. So I regress actual catch on individual and site characteristics and then use that uh, predicted value of catch as a proxy for expected catch, because expected catch should vary with personal characteristics. How many years you've been going to the site, how many years you've been fishing, how big is the, the boat, and all that other stuff. Anyway, so that, that, that was just something I wanted you to think about, and I'm glad it generated a little bit of discussion. There's lots of ways to do it. There's no one right way, um, but uh, you need to find a way that's defensible. And there's some cool endogeneity problems that, that arise. We can talk about those another time. All right, so examples of research questions. Um, that I've been involved with where some of which I needed help from uh, other disciplines and, and some somewhere I didn't. Uh, and so I'll try and point those out. I want to try and get the, the connections uh, between the sciences connected here. This was a uh, study where there was a proposed paper plant uh, going to be built on the Roanoke River in Weldon, North Carolina. And this place where the paper recycling plant, it was a paper recycling plant that was going to be constructed, it happened to be the spawning grounds for, for that guy, striped bass. And so the question was, is this a good idea? Right? The, the paper recycling plant had jobs and revenue and economic impact numbers, uh, but we knew that the quality of the fishing at the site was, was going to suffer dramatically. So we wanted to figure out what were the losses, the potential losses uh, to the recreational fishing sector uh, from the change in water quality that res would result. And so I needed input here uh, from the biologist. Okay, if, if this plant goes in, it's going to change the, change the water. Uh, what is going to be the effect on the species? We fed those uh, species changes into a random utility model. What's interesting is that there was two types of fishers on this, on this river. There was uh, folks that came uh, to catch and keep their, their catch, take it home and, and eat it. And then there was uh, sort of sport anglers, catch and release anglers. Um, the overwhelming amount of the economic value accrued to, which one would you think? Catch and release. Catch and release, yeah. It was something about 95% of the economic value accrued to the catch and release anglers. The, the catch and keep guys were locals 
Uh, came down to the river, fished for an hour, took home their, their bag limit, went home and cooked it up, whereas the catch and release guys traveled for many, many miles, oftentimes stayed days in hotels, spent a lot of money on gear, uh, were the, you know, the, the perhaps more serious anglers. Uh, and so, yeah, they, they derived a lot more, uh, were, were going to suffer a lot more losses had this uh, d development project gone through. Stock allocation question. Um, this was part of my dissertation work at NC State, so this is going back quite a while. But uh, North Carolina is the only state on the East Coast that still allows commercial harvest of that guy. That's the red drum, which are just wonderful to catch and even more wonderful to eat. Um, and so the question that North Carolina has been wrestling with for many, many years is, should we continue to allow commercial harvest of this species, or should we do like all the other states on the East Coast have done and declare it a sport fish, a game fish only? And so we needed to say, okay, what happens if? And if we uh, curtail the commercial harvest, well, then there's going to be a positive effect on the stock. If the stock grows, then recreational catch rates should theoretically go up, which is going to increase recreational angler welfare. So we have costs to the commercial sector on one hand, benefits to the recreational sector on the other hand. Will there be, will there be a net gain? And we had to develop a model that, that incorporated that stock effect in the feedback. Right, because as recreational quality improves, people are going to fish more, which is going to at least partially offset some of that initial stock effect. Um, so this was a, actually a pretty simple sort of predator-prey model. It was a system of uh, ordinary differential equations. And I'm not giving you the details here. But I needed a lot of help with this, especially the biology part. I had to work with the folks who studied Cyanops ocelotus, this, this fish, and parameterize the model. Or, or are the parameters that we're using in terms of natural growth rates, and catchability coefficients, are those reasonable uh, for, this, for this species? There was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of sensitivity analysis over those sort of uncertain parameters. But when you're going to do sensitivity analysis, you need a reasonable range. As an economist, I don't know what a reasonable range is for a natural growth rate uh, for this particular species. So I spent a lot of time learning about uh, the biology of that guy. It was, it, was, it was pretty significant net gains at the end of the day. Um, no matter what we did to commercial harvest, recreational sector had a much larger economic value. Um, we used a demand model for commercial, hat, commercial catch to look at the losses on the commercial side. It was always a net gain. Uh, policy has not, not yet been changed, despite this sort of convincing evidence that this guy's worth a lot more as a sport fish uh, than a commercial fish. Uh, I think politics has a lot to do with that. Another fishing question, um, and this goes back many years, um, but a large petroleum company was considering doing some exploratory drilling off the coast of North Carolina, off the Outer Banks, and the place they wanted to do their exploratory drilling was a very popular commercial and recreational fishing spot. And so we wanted to know, hey, what is the potential damage to the commercial sector and the recreational <laughs> fishing sector if there's an oil spill in transport? This is post Exxon, pre-BP, so we were mostly looking not at, at, uh, at, at spills under, under the water surface, but from tankers. And we did, a, again, a big sensitivity analysis, right? It really depends how big the spill is, when the spill is, which way the wind is blowing. A lot of things could really impact this. So there was a lot of variables that we needed help uh, from the natural sciences. What's a reasonable way to, to look at, okay, if that, water, if that oil spills over here, and it's July, where, where is it going to go? Right? How is it going to affect, how's it gonna affect the species that we're catching here? These are big games, big game fish that we're talking about. So again, this, all that biology really sets the stage for the valuation. That's the point I'm trying to make. You can't do the valuation unless we get the biology and the ecology right. Uh, I mentioned this one yesterday, costs and benefits of alternative options for stabilizing shorelines. This one is in Bald Head Island. Um, so you've got three images here. The big one uh, in the middle is the coast of North Carolina. You can see the Cape Fear River. And you can see um, where the Cape Fear River runs. runs right past Bald Head Island. This is a shipping channel. The Port of Wilmington is out of the frame right now up there in, in Wilmington. Uh, and you can see the, the shipping channel, right? It shows up on the satellite image where the dredging is, has been done. Um, the Army Corps dredged this shipping channel right next to Bald Head Island. And as a result, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of loss of sand from those beaches uh, into, into that channel. 
the top picture you see what the temporary solution was. That's a geothermal, uh, geotextile tubes, uh, groin field. Those are not uh, hard tubes. They're, they're soft tubes filled with sand. That's the temporary solution. You see the result. And down at the bottom, you see the proposed, at least an image of the proposed terminal groin uh, that was going to be put in place. They've started construction. This thing is, is underway. Um, this was not a full-blown valuation study. We didn't have uh, the money, and we didn't have the mandate um, to collect a lot of new data. So it was really relying on uh, engineering costs on the cost side and a lot of information from the coastal ecologists, say, what birds live there? What is, uh, is going to be the loss in, in sand? What is going to be the loss of all the critters around? How are the dunes going to change? And trying to use uh, values in the literature to at least qualitatively express um, what might happen, costs and benefits. And there were lots of options here, right? Leave the tubes in place. Do nothing. Rip the tubes out. Abandon and retreat. Put the hardened structure in place. I think there's a total of five options that we looked at. MCDA, multi-criteria decision analysis. It's a useful tool qualitatively. If you have quantitative information, you can include it. We did. We did have some quantitative information. We had engineering costs of each alternative. We had uh, potential loss of real estate values from inundation. So there was some monetary valuation in there, but no non-market valuation. How much are divers willing to pay to encounter marine turtles? This is a study that we ran in Barbados and in Tobago. Um, these results that, are, that you're looking at right here are from a choice experiment that included a lot of other attributes. It's a little juvenile hawk's bill there. And people are willing to pay a lot to encounter marine turtles underwater. This was, a cho again, a choice experiment that helped derive these results. We had lots of different levels between zero and three or more. Uh, obviously, we have diminishing margin utility. The first turtle is worth more than the second turtle, and so on. Right? So it, it holds up to some economic theory, which is nice to say. Swimming natural assets. What are the policy implications of this? Um, well, it, it seems that, that, that turtles are, are worth more alive than, than dead. Um, you know, one turtle can be encountered potentially thousands of times over its lifetime. Um, but, um, and, and in some places in the Caribbean, they still, there's still an active turtle fishery. Right? So one of the problems with this is that a turtle can be born in Barbados and then just swim across uh, to Trinidad and be harvested. Potential, for pharma uh, potential pharmaceutical value of marine biodiversity for anti-cancer drug discovery. I was not the, the lead on this. Actually, this was two, um, two postdocs in our Center for Marine Science uh, did, this, did this work. We have a postdoc MBA program where um, postdocs in the natural sciences also get uh, an MBA from our business school uh, while they're doing their postdoc, and that's, that's part of their, their program, so that if they do develop um, natural products or, or other things to, that can potentially have uh, market viability, they'll at least have the business acumen to, to get that process started. And so these guys were in the middle of their MBA while we were working on this, on this project. And there's a totally market price uh, approach probability of discovery, probability of uh, a natural product after discovery making its way uh, through the pharmaceutical process. Crowding at dive sites, this is uh, something else we've looked at as a contingent valuation type study in, again, Barbados and Tobago. We found that div divers were very averse uh, to uh, encountering other divers, with the exception of novice divers. <laughs> novice divers actually are willing to pay to have other people in the water. <laughs> This is a pretty logical result. <laughs> the other cool thing about it was that we, we also had coral quality and fish diversity as, as attributes in this choice experiment. Um, the very experienced divers understood the differences between coral cover. They understood the differences in fish diversity and, and were you know, willing to pay more for higher quality. The novice divers were happy if they saw you know, one blue fish. So there was a, a cool implication from this, right? The novice divers who have very little buoyancy control most times um, are banging into the reef and, and causing damage. They're also perfectly happy to be on a fairly crappy reef. <laughs> Whereas the experienced divers with much better buoyancy control, doing less damage to the reef, are willing to pay uh, to be on the higher quality sites. So there's a sort of a distribution question here. Can we allocate the novice divers to, to the worst reefs? Make sure that it's only the experienced divers who go to the high-quality reefs. 
extracting much more willingness to pay. All right, so what, what do I see as fruitful areas for research, uh, interdisciplinary research, that, 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 that has an aspect of valuation to it? Um, we have a lot of evidence of overfishing, but we haven't really tried to understand the economic impacts of overfishing. We're good at understanding the economic value of the fish we extract, uh, but we're not, we don't seem to be maximizing, right? We're, we're missing out on potential revenues, potential employment by mismanaging the resource. We're also, you know, giving up food security and protection against exogenous shocks. Um, is fishing related to tourism? I think it is. Do tourists care about consuming local fish products when they're at a destination? I think they do, uh, but I don't know that they do. How much? Um, also, there's this question of, of culture, right? Historic uh, fishing culture. This is something I think about in the Caribbean. It's also something I think about in North Carolina. Up and down the coast of North Carolina, you have these little, little fishing villages that, that are just you know, really awesome to behold. They've, they've been there in the families for you know, maybe over 100 years, um, and, and they're starting to go away. Um, and is that, is that going to cr create an economic loss? We, we, we can do the market valuation stuff, um, but what about the social values, the, the heritage, the culture uh, that we're going to lose? That's, that's an interesting aspect that, that needs to be addressed, I think, in the Caribbean as well. Um, part of the, the wonderful things about visiting the Caribbean is watching the fishing boats go up and down. But at the same time, if those guys are dropping nets on the reef, that's, that's causing an, an, uh, a negative effect on tourism. So there's this, this balancing act. Fishery subsidies uh, all over the world, especially in the developing world, uh, fishers are subsidized. Right? Fishing is seen often as a employment of the last resort. Uh, food security reasons, we subsidize fishing. Uh, okay, is, w what's the economic losses associated with those subsidies? Or economic benefits associated with those subsidies? I don't think they've been examined in a lot of detail. It's an important question. Again, I mentioned this earlier, supporting and regulating services. Uh, we just haven't done it yet. We, we need to know these, we need these modeling efforts that tell us, okay, how many, how many, uh, hectares of reef uh, create uh, the supporting and regulating services that, that we rely on. This work just needs to be done. It hasn't been done yet. We've got the low-hanging fruit. I think we're doing a good job uh, with the low-hanging fruit. This, these harder questions uh, need work. They need interdisciplinary work. Economists can't do this stuff by ourselves. We're good at the nearshore stuff. We're really bad at the offshore stuff. Other than commercial extraction of pelagics and maybe some game fishing uh, for pelagic species, we don't know much about those ecosystems. We just haven't got there yet. Uh, we know they're important, but we haven't tried to do the valuation work yet. How will tourism change with the environment? Um, I'm going to talk more about this this afternoon in my lightning talk, or sort of what I'm working on right now. Um, but we have these push and pull factors. When, when climate change effects start to, start to happen, um, people's points of origin are going to change and people's potential destinations are going to change. How are they going to change? People are going to redistribute themselves, right? You're going to have less of an incentive to go to a really warm place if where you live is warmer, right? You know, might have more of an incentive to go to a really warm place if where you live is colder. This is an interesting question, right? How are people going to reallocate themselves um, when, when all these effects start to happen? What can we do ahead of time to anticipate those effects? Can we model it now so that we can anticipate those effects? Invasive species. Um, I think about lionfish, right? That, that little sucker moved really fast down the Caribbean chain. It showed up in Barbados how long ago, David? Four years, five years? Three. Three years ago. And now they're everywhere. And just, you know, five years ago we saw zero, and now you can pretty much see them every time you go snorkeling. It's crazy. Uh, it's a really cool looking fish, but it doesn't belong there. Do people know that it doesn't belong there? Right? And what, what role does people's information about the harm that that critter is doing to the ecosystem, what role does that play on the value associated with it? I also think about this in terms of sharks, right? Sharks are a, a critically important species. We had all these shark incidents. They didn't want to call them attacks. We had all these shark incidents in North Carolina this past summer. 
And people are like, kill all the sharks. Oh, like, yeah, really? What do people know? And does what they know, if, if they're ecologically aware that, the, hey, that species is bad, and you think it's good, and that species is good, and you think it's bad, well, you know, what, does that, what does that do to value? And, and what does that mean about education and awareness? And can we kick value in the right direction um, with, with those kind of efforts? We had the same problem with coral bleaching. It w um, we were going to look at you know, the effects of bleached coral on diver utility, diver satisfaction, and willingness to pay. But when we showed some people pictures of bleached coral, they thought it was awesome. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. I mean, if you're dri diving along, and you see this just, it looks like a winter wonderland underwater. And it's obviously, that's a really dead reef. Um, but it looks pretty cool, right? So these, this is important stuff, right? When you're getting to what do people value? People value things that they can see, they can touch, they can taste. If you're going to transfer something that's ecological, biological, into a value estimate, you need that, that indicator, right? What is it that people latch on to? And then they, that's where you have to be careful. 